This was interference with research affects everyone. And here's the thing. Right now, I stand on very important information that I cannot share with the world. So, yeah, there is a, you know, when when my hypothesis, I had a hypothesis of ivermectin increases the bifidobacteria. Um, it was retracted after eight months of being the most read paper in the journal. And by the way, I was the editor on the microbiome in that journal. Okay. And they retracted that hypothesis because it didn't fit with the narrative. It gave ideas to doctors that, hey, ivermectin could work by increasing bifidobacteria. And maybe that's why some doctors are seeing it working maybe in colon cancer. So this is basically what happened, right? So censorship of research, retraction of a hypothesis, you know, woke me up to the corruption and the fact that the journals are captured. Listen, I mean, that is a brilliant. So, you know, I, I hear so many people have lost faith in science. They've lost faith in, in medicine. And I think in, in just that one series of statements you've just made you may have saved medicine for the people who hear what you've just said because that is pure science that is pure medicine you just want an answer you just want to save lives you're not interested in the politics you're not fussing about the stock price you're just trying to find an answer now in, in that context then because where we are now, ivermectin, they're only starting to pull back on the criticism of it with what happened with the FDA, you know, changing. So people are now starting to actually think a little bit more about it. How much have we lost by ignoring or not, I should say, not researching why it could help? This is the, this is the question. People just say, well, it can't work because it's an antiparasitic Instead of saying, well, actually, if it does help, what could be the mechanisms? Right. And, and by the way, um, treatment works. Early treatment works. I've lost no one during the pandemic. No one died. So, And I treated some of the most hypoxic patients. In fact, I published a paper on uh, multi-drug therapy in hypoxic patients treated at home. Okay. So treatment works. I treated, uh, you know, uh, a high official pol politician in South Africa, in South America. I treated people in England. I treated people, you know, high executives, celebrities, millionaires, billionaires, and no one died. No one. So, and I'm a Malibu physician. So believe me, if one of my patients crashed and died, I'd be on People Magazine. So no one died. That tells you right away that interference with research happened and that people didn't really get to understand this virus very well. I think I under, not to kind of, you know, say, you know, I'm doing research. I did. And you said it yourself. You said, you know, you did research for the right reasons, not to be political, not for the price of a stock. Let me just tell you why I did research. I did research for me first. I needed to understand this virus before it attacks me. I did research for my kids, for my husband, for my, my parents. I wanted to understand what this virus was doing and what the vaccine was doing too, right? Before, so that I can make, as a scientist that's been doing 30 years of clinical trials for pharma, as a scientist, I wanted to see, to do my own research for me first. Because ultimately, when you interfere with the research, and you get a different answer because you're trying to make money, the only person you're gonna affect is you because you're gonna be the patient because you interfered with research to try to make money. Money is not gonna save you. Trust me, there's so many billionaires that have cancer right now and they're dying to have some kind of answer. Mon they will give all their money to get another year or two to live with their kids. So money doesn't save you. Good research, unbiased research, non-political research will save you. And that's what I try to do this pandemic. And yes, I, could be wrong. I could be wrong, but guess what? Here's my statement to everybody that criticized me. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. 
That's it. You don't have to retract my paper. Prove me wrong. I proved that ivermectin increased the bifidobacteria, and I presented it at the American College of Gastro as an abstract. Okay, it's yet to be published. But guess what? Prove me wrong. Do the experiment. Wow. So yeah. So this is this is important stuff, Sabine. I mean, we haven't even touched on the microbiome yet and you know this is this is so fascinating to listen to but before we even go to the microbiome what were your thoughts with that kind of work with early treatment what were your thoughts when you saw the transition of the world where suddenly all the eggs are put in one basket everything else was stopped no treatment everybody just needs to be inoculated what were your thoughts well, my first thought is I don't trust anyone anymore. So that was my first thing, because remember, I'm in the clinical trial business. I brought vaccines to market. And when I saw the research being done poorly, that was one of the big red red stop for me. So, um, so yeah, my thoughts were I don't trust any anyone. And I definitely don't trust these vaccines because the research is done improperly. And why would they stop early treatment? You know, isn't our mission as physicians, as scientists, to save as many lives as possible? Why would you stop a treatment? My idea during the pandemic is put everything on the fire, you know, do the vaccines for the high risk, do the treatment, put everything, like just turn off the fire, stop the virus in its motion, right? Um, it didn't happen. Unfortunately, um, this virus did mutate. It got up to Delta and then eventually Omicron came around and that was the big savior in my opinion because it kind of like made us realize, wait a minute, we have a natural uh, virus that's created out of an unnatural one in a way. Um, so this was how, you know, the pandemic occurred and it's a shame that they didn't just want to do all of it together. And then you go back, you know, when you have a fire, you put, you use all sorts of buckets with water, hoses. You don't say, oh, this one has a better high pressure. You just turn off the fire and then you look back and you say, you know, the high pressure hose turned off a lot of houses from burning than the bucket, right? That's what should have happened. It should have been a retrospective study in the sense that, hey, doctors, here's a protocol. Do your protocol, innovate. You're out there on the field treating patients. We trust you, your patient-doctor relationship. You know, when we talk about hydroxychloroquine and ZPAC, I wrote the protocol. We had two pages of medications that were contraindicated with hydroxychloroquine. So if you don't take the history properly to look at the medications that are contraindicated, you're giving it to the patient. You're not gonna achieve success. You have to do due diligence. On the same side with ivermectin, we had another two pages, well, actually one page of drugs that were contraindicated, right? So you have to take that into consideration when you treat a patient. And therefore, medicine happens on the front line between a patient and a doctor. What should have happened is it should have been a lot of different protocols, whoever wrote the protocols, put them out there. You know, the government should have stepped in and said, look, here are all the protocols that we approved and, you know, feel free as doctors to evaluate and start treating and stop the virus from going on. But instead, they suppressed early treatment because there was a price of a stock that was behind it, okay, to sell the vaccines. And then when they couldn't sell the vaccine because of the fact that people lost trust and people got covid you know, after they got vaccinated and they saw others that weren't vaccinated, still standing, still not having COVID, then they, their, you know, light bulbs started, the lack of trust started happening, right? For me, the lack of trust happened from the beginning because I'm in the clinical trial field. When I see a patient is given a vaccine in a pharmacy and it's a kid and we're not even enrolling in the kid's trial yet, and there's no informed consent given to that kid, and the kid gets a vaccine in a pharmacy, we have a problem. I had a problem with that because I said, we're vaccinating everyone. Nobody's getting proper informed consent. I had a friend of mine as a photographer, had a coagulopathy after the vaccine. She was on birth control pill. Now, 
were we supposed to be giving birth control pill with the vaccine? Good question, right? But certainly had this woman read informed consent, knew about the coagulopathies from the vaccines, right? Even though minimal, she would have probably made a different choice for her because now she's on blood thinners for the rest of her life. So this is the problem. Informed consent was not given. Suppression of science, interference with research happened. And unfortunately, that affects everyone. Yeah, this is some some huge statements, you know, Sabine, because um, the damage that has been done to the credibility of science and medicine is humongous. I mean, I keep on warning people. I, I'm saying to them, listen, some brown stuff is going to hit the fan. And when it does, if you are not standing up and advocating for patients, they will never trust you again. And the this brown is stuff is hitting the fan because the microbiome is in capsules right now. So yes, if we don't do the research, if we don't stand up right now to understand the research better, we are going to get stuck with a lot of problems down the road, especially so with my...